tumors. Removed. One resulting in a punctured facial nerve and facial paralysis for six months. Cancer. Corporate lawsuits, layoffs, divorce, five years of custody battles, gun violence. Before the age of 30, I had experienced life and death more than once. When you all saw me standing here, you had a thought. And hearing these words of pain and survival, you had other thoughts, perhaps triggered by your own experiences. When a thought occurs and rapidly vaults to its conclusion, that is what we call in neuroscience a ballistic process. Over a hundred years ago, a scientist by the name of Ivan Pavlov established this concept of reflexes in the brain. My name is Sarah Baldeo, and I'm a neuroscientist who spent many hours in research labs, tracking and measuring the physiological responses of the brain when confronted with mountains of information. Your brain is full of superpowers, just waiting to be unlocked. But what comes to mind when you think of superpowers? Maybe flying, being invisible, reading the thoughts of others. We don't often think about the superpowers of our brains. What if every time something chaotic or disastrous happened in your life, you could control your reaction to that event instead of panicking or shutting down? That would be a pretty phenomenal superpower. Well, today I'm going to share with you a transformative tool I discovered in my research, which I called ballistic interruption. Your brains are all chock full of ballistic processes. Those thoughts that are related to survival and the way we perceive threats in our environment are ballistic processes. As you think about a neuron firing, ballistic processes happen all the time. And once a neuron is fired, it's extremely difficult to stop an intrusive thought or emotional reaction once it's begun. Particularly when your limbic system is engaged which controls instinct and emotion. Or when neurotransmitters, those are chemicals in the brain like dopamine for pleasure, cortisol for stress response, or adrenaline for excitement, are coursing through our bodies. Picture what happens when you're hungry and maybe in the distance you see some golden arches in the shape of an M. Or what about when there's a fire alarm in your office building? Perhaps you look down at your phone and your caller ID says, mom. And you think to yourself, I just don't have 30 minutes right now to help somebody reset their Facebook password yet again. <laughs> in all of these examples I just mentioned, ballistic process mode is engaged. Ballistic interruption is this concept of redirecting panic to logic in situations of stress, trauma, and anxiety. The first step of ballistic an interruption training is awareness. Awareness of our innate biological engineering, and the impact that it can have on our perceptions and biases. This requires you to go beyond pausing in the moment or just mindfulness. It requires intense reflection on your instinctual reactions. 
You need to practice refocusing your attention on the internal reactions happening to you as opposed to the external threats around you. That initial mental redirection takes practice and strength. And initially, it may feel uncomfortable and possibly inauthentic. But that is simply because our brains were designed for maximum efficiency. Our brains love to use established neural pathways. It's just easier. Learning something new requires neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is that phenomenal ability of the human brain to change and grow. Myelin, a fatty lipid protein, forms around a nerve fiber and it helps electrical conduction. As you're learning something new, the neural synapse is surrounded by a thickening myelin sheath every time you repeat a behavior. That is precisely why ballistic interruption requires repetition. In the 17th century, René Descartes had already begun exploring brain physiology. Yet, despite these discoveries, we have yet to invest in brain retraining. Now, as much as we love to all think that we're so beautifully evolved as people, in the past 2.5 million years, your brains have only grown by 30%. And I don't say that to make you feel bad. The majority of that growth has happened in the frontal cortex or the neocortex. That's the part right here at the front, so make sure you keep it protected. It's the part of your brain that controls thought, analysis, and reflection. Now, what hasn't grown during that time? Your limbic system. Sometimes it's referred to as your reptilian brain or your lizard brain, simply because it is such an ancient structure. Your amygdala is part of your reptilian brain, and it's considered your emotion center. Your hippocampus is also part of your reptilian brain, and it's your memory center. Emotion and memory two crucial components tied to stimuli reactions, and the part of your brain that hasn't changed much. In the past, human beings relied on essentially two options when we were faced with threats to our survival and danger. Kill or be killed. There simply wasn't time to pause, analyze, and reflect. Historically, kill or be killed were pretty great options in the face of a lion or an earthquake, for example. But in today's dynamic and complex world, in the face of what often feels like a bigger threat than a lion, relying on those ancient methods of handling stress exacerbates our traumas, and renders us helpless. Step two, rationalization is the process of establishing what we perceive as a threat, why it's even a danger to us, the transience or permanence of that threat, and then formulating a plan. Planning <clears throat> ties both our hippocampus and our frontal cortex together. It truly builds a bridge between your reptilian brain, remember, that's your ancient brain, and your new brain. And that connection is fundamental to your ability to control your reactions by focusing on your plans. Let's picture your doctor calls you and says, hello, 
we're going to need to do some further tests. It would be perfectly normal to imagine worst case scenarios in that moment. Rationalization would include thinking about what date are you going to see the doctor? What are you going to wear? What are you even going to do after these further medical tests? You would have adjusted your initial reaction of potential panic to focusing on your plan of action as to how you survive this traumatic event. The final step of ballistic interruption training is neuronal visualization. Visualizing your newly established neural synapses and the thought trajectory that you would have built end to end. Engaging your occipital lobe, that's your vision center, it's actually at the back of your head, helps you to reinforce your ability to avoid relying on the ancient methods of handling stress. Picture with me, your neurons firing, your frontal cortex lighting up, and visualize the control that you possess in that moment. Visualizing directly strengthens your ability to think and analyze via your neocortex. During ballistic interruption, it requires you to combat signals that have been established since before you were even born. For many of us, the pandemic is the longest trauma that we faced, and it subjected us to fears for our health, our jobs, our children. The future ahead of us was uncertain and unstable. That experience transformed lives and left an indelible impact on the way we're still navigating, trying to figure out how the human mind was impacted by that prolonged exposure to fear. For me, repeated experiences of facing life and death, it's precisely what inspired me to research develop and further understand the process of ballistic interruption. At 24 years old, I was married and shortly thereafter, pregnant. And I was absolutely delighted in no small part because life seemed to be going according to my perfectly orchestrated master plan. If you happen to be a list maker, like me, that sheer satisfaction of things going according to your plan, checking items off your to-do list, oh, it's so satisfying. In that moment of life with the promise of becoming a mother, I was an ecstatic list checker. At about 20 weeks of my pregnancy, I got a call from my OBGYN and she told me that during an ultrasound, the technician had discovered what looked like it could be a hole in between the chambers of my baby's heart. Suddenly, I was helpless. The words she was saying, the explanations, the instructions she was giving me of where I needed to go for a fetal echocardiography appointment, none of it made sense. My brain wanted to shut down. This was a ballistic process. And I hadn't yet mastered that beautiful art I've just explained to you of ballistic interruption. Here was something I couldn't dissect, I couldn't control. I had no lists to check off. After a gruesome four days of testing at Sick Kids Hospital, they informed me that there was an anomaly on the ultrasound and my baby was going to be just fine. Everything was okay. The battle for survival 
was one. But the story doesn't stop there. At about six months pregnant, I loved this person growing inside me already, and I hadn't even met him or her. I had three months left to go, and I got to meet my baby. I got a call from my new OBGYN at Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto, and he informed me that during routine screening, they discovered stage four cancer cells in my body, and I needed to come and talk to him about the next steps. Well, the next steps ended up being faced with an ultimatum. Immediately have surgery to remove these aggressive cancer cells and face the very high likelihood of a miscarriage or postpone the surgery, have my baby, and risk my own life. My life versus the life of my child. That's the truth of what it came down to. As I focused on neuroscience as a lifeline in those heavy moments that I just shared with you, I was building new neural synapses and behaviorally reprogramming my brain for how to react to these massive stressors. What's your big audacious battle? What in your life is threatening to take control of your mind and attention? Of the hundreds of survivors of trauma that I've interviewed who've experienced war, loss, health scares, anxiety, and depression, they all have one crucial thing in common. They wish they could control their reactions to the traumas that they're facing, and learning to retrain their brain dramatically changes their lives. Inside of all of you is the potential to create an alternate path for how you navigate the obstacles that you will face and ultimately overcome. Forming new neural synapses creates resilience to not only survive, but to really thrive and live your life. I am 12 years cancer-free, and my son, Ethan, is about to turn 13 years old. <laughs> I ask each of you, are you ready to retrain your brain? Could you use some superhero qualities in your life today? Thank you. Mm -hmm.